So, good morning. We will start with the morning session with uh, lightning, uh, uh, lightning uh, talks. And for the presenters, we go from the bottom up. So, if you want your, your name here, then you are the, the first, like this. And if you want your name here, and you are the last, you get five minutes. So, this, um, but we have uh, a bit of time left, so you can be easy. So. The first one is on data management and integral with Oh, I will repeat it. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, um, just realized that I'm happy to be the first presenter. And um, I'm uh, Jan Polowinski from uh, the Saxon State and University Library in Dresden. And I would like to point you at this form, our current project on data management and uh, integration, which is together, uh, developed together with the Dresden company uh, Avantgarde Labs. Um, this one is an open source middleware for data integration. And um, usually you have uh, these various uh, front ends in a, in a library. Maybe you have a discovery system and they are somehow connected to um, various backends that the librarians curate. And where DSWARM comes into the game is uh, that it's an in-between, a middle uh, solution um, that helps to connect to linked open data sources, integrate these sources from the web, and also offers um, means to, to export linked open data again. And um, there will be uh, another lightning talk in a few minutes on an electronic resource, resource uh, management system called AMSL. Um, and this system will, for example, be such a front end using our middleware. It's developed by our partner project from the university uh, library in Leipzig. So I cannot go into details on the whole architecture of uh, this form, but I would like to point you at the most uh, important issues. So what's important to us is a convenient graphical user interface. Then we have a data hub, a, whole, a huge graph where everything is uh, collected. And then we have also some extra <coughs> settings in the database. So. First, let's look at this aspect, um, DSWARM as a flexible data storage. So with DSWARM, we can achieve lossless integration from various sources. Uh, for example, uh, CSV files, XML files, but also other sources, and then put it into a flexible data model, which is this data hub. And uh, currently, it's implemented by a graph database, a property graph database, uh, which is called Neo4j. And when you look at this picture, you already see that uh, there are some green bubbles. So um, we have various subgraphs in this graph. We have one graph for each imported source. And we have uh, one specific subgraph, the internal model. And then we have also a lot of data around for versioning and provenance information, which is all stored in this graph. When you look at uh, the graph with the inbuilt uh, visualization feature of Neo4j, it looks somehow like this. So you see we, uh, we use um, the nodes and relationships of this uh, graph database, but we also have, um, we also rep represent uh, parts of RDF here. So we have URIs, we have um, resources um, that represent types and um, so we, we are able to also export RDF and um, currently this is implemented like this that we um, export the whole graph but in future there will be the possibility for example to, to take this green <coughs> internal model and pick a specific version of it and then export this uh, as RDF or connect it somehow to your 
uh, front ends. What's not currently implemented but will be part of the development in the next weeks is deduplication and favorization which all comes from this graph and goes back to this graph but I cannot go into detail here. Uh, what is currently modeled is um, uh, implemented is uh, this form as a data modeling tool. So we have an alpha release where you can already try this and uh, another aspect that I want to stress is that we, um, for us, it's important that it's a convenient user interface. So we want to enable non-programming librarians to use the system. Uh, what you see here is a modeling perspective. You can uh, do schema mappings. So you have a, a source schema here on, the, on this side and then you uh, draw arrows to the target schema and once you've created such a mapping, you can add further transformations also via the user interface. You can pick from a list of uh, functions that uh, currently stem from a, a component that is called um, um, MetaFactor. And uh, you can configure these transformations and then uh, create more complex mappings. So what you just saw on the on the right side was this target schema and I want to say a few words about this target schema. It can be freely constructed from concepts of multiple existing vocabularies. So you don't, uh, you will usually not create your own uh, vocabulary but just combine it from existing ones. And once you've created such an internal schema, you can share it with others but you can still have your own. So every uh, instantiation of this software can have its own schema. So a last word on the sharing features. Why is it called dSwarm at all? And that's because all these settings, for example, this internal schema, but also all the mappings, all the transformations, import config configurations can be shared with others. So this is a future feature, but it is important for us because we think um, that you can then reuse useful mappings that one person has already done. So that's all. If you want to try uh, the software, um, you will find uh, a form to uh, receive the username and password and you can try the first features. Thanks. So good morning. I'm uh, Ted Lawless from Brown University uh, in Providence, Rhode Island in the States. Um, there's my contact information. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some work that I've been doing um, this week. Uh, I think a theme and the previous talk also sort of reinforced this, that there's a theme where as librarians or data managers, we want to store data with rich relationships and uh, we want to create that and publish it, but we want um, people to contribute that data and not um, know a lot about the sort of rich relationships behind the scenes. We want them to help us create this data, but we want to make it easy to do so. And sort of the project I've been working on, which is the motivation for what I'm going to talk about, is um, Vivo, which is a, um, a research portal that describes and displays uh, research activities at a university. It's built on um, semantic web standards. It's an open source project. The link is there. Uh, the second link is our implementation at Brown University. So in our particular case, we um, are aggregating information about faculty from a variety of sources and, and publishing that into their profile pages. Um, but some of the data um, needs to be updated or curated directly by the faculty. So not all of it we can harvest from sources. And what we needed was a very simple way for faculty to um, update this information with uh, no training because faculty are 
um, as I'm sure you're aware, very busy and they don't have a lot of extra time to learn new interfaces. So this is our, our public uh, version of our, our, our system. So this is a pretty standard profile. You have a picture, a description of what this researcher does, um, what departments on campus they're affiliated with, and sort of topics of uh, research that they're interested in. Um, so to keep this information up to date, we, we came up with a custom web application built with uh, the Python web framework Django. And it um, reads data out of the Vivo uh, triple store using Sparkle and provides some nice editing widgets using uh, modern JavaScript libraries. And then we write data back um, to the triple store over HTTP. Um, we make heavy use of the Python library RDF lib for creating and manipulating RDF. Um, and so what the user sees um, when they log in is, is a page that looks like this. They can um, type into that biography box, which becomes a rich text editor to update sort of textual information. They can change their photo, uh, add a, a PDF of their CV, and so on. It's a single page application, so they can use the navigation on the left to jump between sections so they don't have to learn a sort of complex layout. Um, but sort of the more interesting things that we're doing um, is starting to link up topics. So this is an autocomplete where users can enter their research areas. And when they choose a research area here, there is a URI um, behind the scenes that's um, sort of aggregating all of these. So we have uh, SCOS concepts being stored in the triple store that the user just needs to uh, pick from a list. And the same with uh, identifying collaborators on campus. Um, this searches our roster of faculty. So this faculty member can say, I work with uh, this other faculty member. And that's allowing us to start to create some relationships and um, do some interesting things with this data so that we can help people find each other on campus that they might not be aware that someone else is doing similar or related research. Um, a little bit more there about the technologies we used. I'll, I'll send out a link to this. Um, there's a video here with more details um, of a, another presentation I gave on this. Um, so if you want uh, more details, if you're interested in trying out Vivo, we have a Vagrant uh, script that will just uh, install it on an empty virtual machine for you so you can get started and, and start working with it. And also, if you're interested in this type of work, there, um, I'm a part of a working group that meets every other Tuesday. Uh, there's a link there to that. And I, I like to think of it as an interest group for people uh, that are uh, trying to build end user applications for creating linked data. And um, uh, we have some pretty good presentations. If you have an idea, you can present it to the group and get, get feedback. And there is my contact information again. Thank you. Hello everyone and good morning. Um, my name is Lydia Unterdörfer. I'm from the Leipzig University Library in Germany. And I am working there as a system librarian. And currently I'm working in a, a project which aims to build an electronic resource management system based on linked data technologies. Um, very short, what is a purpose of electronic resource management systems. We just want to manage all information within the so-called life cycle of an electronic resource. So um, that's a lot of information. Um, when we do that, we have a lot of, uh, face a lot of challenges. And one of them is the variety of information 
we want to integrate. And of course, we just want, don't uh, only want to um, like collect all these informations, we also want to link them and qualify these links. Another um, challenge, of course, are where we heterogeneous formats and sources we um, have to deal with. I think you all are familiar to this, like Excel, XML, or also PDF documents we get, for example, from the vendors. And um, last but not least, um, a big challenge is that uh, there are changing business models and um, also publication formats. And, you know, on one side we have like little, little small pay-per-view um, contracts, on the other side we have the big deals. And, well, um, from our point of view this is really not very predictable what will come in the future. And to cope all these challenges we um, need an electronic resource management system that is flexible because it uses a flexible data model. Um, for those of you who are already kind of into electronic resource management system, we don't want to build a knowledge base. A knowledge base is like, from our point of view, more fo focused on the data. We want to build an application that is um, <coughs> capable of um, importing knowledge bases, and so it, um, what we want to provide are the functions. Um, our approach to um, accomplish these uh, flexibility, um, we have a different approach and the first one is um, we use RDF, the resource description framework, as a flexible um, uniform data model. It just gives us what uh, we are searching for, the flexible model. And um, we use the OntoWiki, which is a tool um, for creating and um, um, editing, importing linked data um, as well. And it um, was developed by the research group Agile Knowledge Engineering and Semantic Web. This one is hosted by the University Library, of, uh, by the University of Leipzig. And um, we use that tool as a graphical user interface. Um, we also uh, want to use, uh, or already using, reusing linked data ontologies, but they are not, um, um, they don't meet any of our needs, or all of our needs, so we are also creating own elements in our own ontology. And um, of course the best way to like feed our onto wiki, our user interface, is when we get native RDF, but um, of course we also have to migrate other formats into RDF. And um, at the end, we also want to link, of course, our data with existing linked data graphs. So um, this is a screenshot of the Onto Wiki. Um, at the top left, you can see some knowledge bases we already have integrated. Some of them we, uh, we made up on our own. And, uh, Below that you see some classes of our ontology and in the middle there's kind of um, details, uh, a detail view for a contract. Like, um, <coughs> yeah, you see some, uh, like the duration of the contract. So, that's uh, the final impression <laughs> of this lightning talk. Um, we have a blog, amsel.technology, dot technology. Um, English information will come soon, and um, the second uh, link, when you follow this one, you will find um, our ontology, our elements. Um, and our project is founded by the European Regional Development Fund, so it will be all open source. And I hope I, um, you, you found something interesting, and uh, we really appreciate questions or any kind of feedback, so please um, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you for your attention.
hello, uh, my name's Owen Stevens. I'm a consultant working with libraries mainly in the UK university sector and I'd like to just share some information uh, with you this morning about uh, something I've been working on that uh, was a project looking at how you could make digital resources easier to find online. Uh, this was a project, came out of a project called Spotlight on the Digital, which was funded by uh, JISC, uh, which is a UK uh, funding organisation in the HE space, especially related to libraries. And over the years, they funded many projects to digitise um, materials um, from library collections, museum collections, and, um, and archive collections. And they were interested in looking at um, are these things still available online? Do the websites still work? Are the collections still available? Uh, if so, can people find them easily? Uh, and what advice we would give to, um, to digital, collect digital collections now about making their stuff easier to find online? So one of the things we did, we, uh, we, we uh, got a, a lot of input from uh, practitioners in the space talking to people responsible for digital collections or managing digital collections or managing teams that manage digital collections uh, and w one of the things they were very keen to stress to us was that we should start by thinking about what users, how users behave, what they wanted as opposed to starting from kind of what collections are and what they do. And so we, we did a literature review uh, looking at six major reports published in the last four years about user searching and discovery behaviour and, looking and trying to work out, trying to map that against behaviours related to different types of users, specifically researchers, uh, teachers and students in higher education. Um, and there were 14 major behaviours that we identified and that uh, link there links you to a page that describes those 14 behaviours. Um, but I think that unsurprisingly, um, the, uh, the, main, the, the first user behaviour in terms of discovery, general, using a general search engine, I mean, essentially that is use Google, uh, is, is the thing that comes out again and again in all the reports. And this goes back, actually, we, we, try, we drew a line in terms of timing. We didn't want to go back too historically to look at user behaviour, but I think reports even before 2010 were, were reflecting the same behaviour. Um, so a lot of what we then looked at in terms of how do you improve the discoverability of your users, how do you make it easier to find your resources, was thinking about how this stuff appears on the web as opposed to how it appears in your local discovery systems. That, that said, we were told quite strongly by people working in the sector, we also had to pay attention to those other aspects because there are there are users and there are user behaviours who do go straight to the library systems to find this stuff. So it's not uh, just Google, although we, we were led by the web here. We also wanted to understand what organisations wanted to achieve. Um, and we surveyed uh, heads of library services in UK universities asking what it was they, wanted, they were trying to deliver for their organisation, what were the aims of the organisation. And um, that link there takes you to the full uh, information about that. But there were six key aims, and, and including the obvious, I think, but enabling research, enriching te teaching and learning, and enabling access to resources in a cost-effective way. We looked at around 200 digital collections that uh, have been created through projects over the last uh, I don't know, eight years. We ran a series of manual and automated tests looking at things like how did, the, how did the collection and items in the collection appear in Google results, finding relevant keywords, did, it, did, did the items or the collections appear in the top 10 Google results for relevant keywords or by a direct title search, uh, citations in Wikipedia, um, other references in Wikipedia, uh, looking at good web practice, you know, ha have the pages got unique and descriptive page titles, do they use alt descriptions on images, um, and um, what we found was that generally collections performed pretty well on our metrics. So at a collection level, if you searched for keywords that were relevant to collection, you'd find the page for the collection. But if you looked at 
item level, so finding individual items within that collection via search engines, via Wikipedia, they performed quite poorly. And just an, a single example of that, 98% of the collections had well-formed page titles that were unique and descriptive. Only 47% of item pages had well-formed page titles in the HTML. So the kind of thing we saw for items was the same page title repeated again and again and again for every single item in the collection, mainly either with the collection name or often the system name in it. So, um, you know, a museum at Reading, Adlib, University of Reading, uh, Adlib being the system. You know, it's uh, uh, just systems turning out the same stuff for a template for each page. So, the final thing we, did, we uh, produced was a guide um, that, um, that you can use that covers a, a wide range of things you can do to improve how people can find your um, resources, um, ranging from using how you can work with search engines, making, good, making search engines work for you, uh, using social media, getting into aggregations, uh, working with academics, creating collection champions to uh, embed your materials in the community, um, uh, integrating it with big search discovery indexes like Summon or Primo Central. All of those things are covered in a range of tips. So under each one of these, uh, there's a, uh, so usability we have here, some stuff on usability. There's a description of what we're talking about, how it supports strategic outcomes for your organisation if you need to make a case for work. Um, what discoverable behaviours it's meant to support and then a series of tips about stretching your URLs with links to examples of good practice, Cambridge Digital Library and how they stretch their URLs for their digital content, uh, how you might go about measuring success of a measure, so if you do this, what kind of measures you can look at to, um, to see were you successful in your aims and links to more information, skills and knowledge you might need, how much it might cost you to do in a, in a rough scale, and what resources there are to help you achieve it. And that's uh, the guide, um, and I'll just put the URL back up there. If you want to use it, I hope it's useful. Thank you. Hello and good morning. Um, I like to say some words about a, a small piece of software we are currently um, developing. Um, the development is part of the much larger project uh, Think, which um, uh, builds search engines for uh, several university libraries in Saxony. Uh, this time we hired a company to take out the actual software development, but, um, but anyway everything will be or is open source right from the beginning. Please see the GitHub link above. Think oh. um, um, is based on WooFind which uses um, Apache Solar as search engine technology and Apache Solar um, offers a mechanism called charting, which allows to spread um, solar queries across multiple indices, um, but this requires that all indices share the same schema. So if you have uh, several um, solar indices with, with different uh, schemas, uh, charting will not be possible. That's why we try to um, um, we try to develop a software that um, um, spreads queries across multiple uh, indices and collects the results. And the basic step-by-step um, -step functionality will be that the software receives the actual solar query from the application, translates the query for several um, servers and their schemas, afterwards collects the results from these servers, recalculates the score values, and um, probably does some data manipul 
population on them, merges the results and sends the results back to the um, application. There may be some concerns about this approach regarding data quality or the relevance calculation and um, we say yes it is, an, it is an experiment and if it's good enough it's just fine. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in this kind of software, if you uh, need to um, merge um, um, different solar indices then please feel free to join the development or um, see what we are doing there. Thank you. Hello, my name is Theodore Tolstoy from Sweden. Uh, and I intend to have the RFID, RFID and mobile phone quiz for you. And these are based on some findings I did while uh, developing the Viola phone app that me and Eva will talk about later this afternoon. Uh, Do you know, uh, everyone has heard about the RFID? technology I reckon that's the thing there on the right with a device that never worked I think uh, and then you have the NFC technology which some of you may know and it was uh, you can do all kinds of things with it if it is to be implemented sometimes in the future uh, it's a standard for telephones and other technology to interact with different type of cards and uh, devices and stuff like that. So, uh, now it's time for quiz and I'll encourage you all to stand up and <laughs> the prize is uh, uh, something tasteful for the tea uh, after this uh, the break. And if you have the wrong answer, you just sit down, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> so, is RFID a subset of the NFC stack? <laughs> uh, yes. yes, with a bit of convincing, since it's uh, it's out there on the left, on the outskirts. So. <laughs> Yeah, but still, it, it is. You have to judge yourself. Yeah, you have to judge yourself. Does the iOS operating system uh, support NFC? No. <laughs> Does the iPhone hardware support NFC? Not many standing yet. No. <laughs> Well, if you buy the accessories, of course, it's always. Uh, <laughs> what about Android? Uh, what about Android? Does it support RFID reading? Does your average Android phone support NFC? Uh, well, uh, of course, this is a. But I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, phew. Standing. Can you read RFID tags on Android phones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them. Uh, and this was a finding that was kind of hard. We were in the process of buying uh, quite a few uh, phones for our staff and we found out that the Galaxy S3 that is very similar to the Galaxy Nexus which is at the same iteration of Android did not support it but the Galaxy S4 so the staff is quite happy with this uh, quite fancy phone so, uh. what about Windows Phone? 
It does. <laughs> but you were, let's see, how many were standing? Uh, you three out? Uh, come to me later. Uh, it's uh, shareable, this snack. The thing is, with, with uh, Windows Phone, it supports NFC, but only on a very high level, so you can only talk to some uh, very special uh, high-level formatted <coughs> NFC cards. And this was something I found out the hard way. Uh, there might be a fix for this in this autumn release of Windows Phone. And uh, I struggled to, fi to find the answer on this, but uh, it's actually no. Uh, it doesn't. And uh, yeah, and this was uh, another question if there were many standing, but uh, it's asking. Yes. And with this as a finishing slide, I thank, thank you. We've got 15 minutes to the end, so I could really slow down. But knowing me, I won't. Um, hi, I'm Richard Wallace, Technology Evangelist at OCLC. Those that know me know I witter on about linked data endlessly, but I'm paid to do so. Um, and I keep mentioning a vocabulary called schema.org, and this is one of the favourite questions I get why schema.org. So this presentation is to kind of answer that question. Uh, why schema.org, particularly for libraries and associated things. So, stepping back a bit, why do we uh, catalogue? Well, we catalogue so people can find our stuff. But where are those people? Um, they're, they're actually in Google. They're on mobile devices in Google. On mobile devices, really, that's the place you end up, unless you bought a Microsoft phone and then you end up at Bing, but it's the same thing. Uh, that pattern is being shown. Here are some statistics from the National Library of France with their catalogue, which they made open for the search engines to harvest. And they discovered that over 80% of the users were getting to the detail page, what you might call the destination in an OPAC, uh, directly from the search engines, bypassing the search prompt and all that wonderful indexing that they've got. So we can say that our users are in um, Google. Uh, not as some might think, Google Scholar, Google Book Search, in general, there are others. Google, I, I must add, there are other search engines around. But our data are not in Google, in general terms. Why is that? Well, Google does not understand Mark, ISBD, OMA, PH, RDA, Z3950, BibFrame, and I'm sure we could think of a few other standards that they don't understand. Google does understand schema.org. Why do they understand schema.org? Because Google, along with Bing, Yahoo and Yandex, put the standard together. They cooperated, which is an interesting word to use in, in line with for developers like organisations like this, but they developed it because they had a shared problem understanding uh, structured data off the web and they also realised if any one of them had come up with this standard half the world wouldn't use it for political <coughs> or commercial reasons so they cooperated. Schema.org is a broad vocabulary for describing things people, places, events, uh, emotions, subjects, all sorts of things. Uh, we used it at OCLC uh, to add linked data to WorldCat a couple of years ago if you go to the bottom of the WorldCat page, you'll find hiding under a tab so it doesn't frighten the users uh, a set of linked data at that time mostly described using schema.org. So you can see the, uh, the schema.org reference to, so that you can identify what sort of resource this is, in this case a book. 
uh, you can follow schema, uh, same as um, about relationships to Dewey, so you can identify the classification it was catalogued under it. You can follow other uh, about relationships to the Library of Congress, so you can see what subject it was catalogued under. We followed the same pattern with the recent release of uh, a canonical set of work identifiers and descriptions from WorldCat, all 197 million of them, encoded using schema.org, using the standard RDF serializations, with links down to those WorldCat manifestations I was just showing you, which have been enhanced to put the reciprocal links back up to the work level, enabling you to navigate your way around the manifestations associated with a particular work. Uh, links out to Dewey, Library of Congress, subject headings, name, authority, via FAST and other places. It's on an open data licence, so you can use it, released uh, a month and a bit ago. I encourage you to have a look at that. Meanwhile, back at schema.org, which a bit of history, released in June 2011, about a year later at this badly photographed panel, uh, the, the search engines were saying that 7 to 10% of the pages they were crawling daily contained schema.org now. And, and today they're saying roughly 15% of the web is using schema.org as its markup. That's right across the commercial space. In the library world, I'm often asked, is schema.org good enough for library data exchange? No. It's not deep enough, it's not rich enough to get the fidelity of data that we've been capturing in mark records for decades. Is it good for sharing library data with the rest of the world? Almost and it's getting better. It's getting better because I formed and chaired this, this group, the W3C Community Group Scheme of Bibexten, which uh, at its peak had some 80 members from publishers to ILS vendors to libraries and other people uh, proposing extensions to Screamer.org to uh, uh, improve its description of bibliographic data. Several proposals have gone in, several have been accepted, there's still one or two in the pipeline. There's an important one around periodicals and articles that's due to go in fairly soon. So my conclusion is that libraries should use schema.org to describe and link their resources to the web at the same time as applying other vocabularies uh, and standards where necessary for our own internal within the library sector um, um, reasons. So that's why I'm suggesting Schema.org for libraries and many other sectors. There's my contact details. This will be up on um, slide share in a few minutes. Thank you very much.